Previously on Mafia. Using bribery and violence, Al Capone had quickly taken control of Chicago's thriving bootlegging industry. Capone senses that he's in the right place at the right time, that Chicago is the perfect environment for a gangster on the rise to make a lot of money very quickly through prohibition. But he's not the only supplier in town. The Northside gang, led by Bugs Moran, had been bitter rivals with Capone's outfit for a long time. Too long. He thought he had to eliminate the Bugs Moran gang so he could be, if you want to call it, the boss of bosses. No competition in Chicago. They tried and failed to take out Al Capone himself. And Capone, lover of the spotlight, had just made national headlines with an all-out massacre. One that neither the law enforcement nor the other gangsters will stand for. This is broad daylight. This is not in some secretive, you know, a farm field at midnight in the middle of nowhere. This is downtown Chicago, middle of the day, and ruthless assassination in a very clever way, by the way. This is Mafia. While Capone was busy fighting with Moran for Chicago's supremacy, the gangsters in New York had a different idea. Lucky Luciano, Capone's counterpart, wanted to find a way of having all of the street gangs work together. Luciano's idea was to put an end to the violent infighting and focus on the money and avoiding the law. In the wake of the Valentine's Day Massacre, Luciano and other New York mobsters planned a conference in Atlantic City. Lana Guggenheim is an educator at the Museum of the American Gangster in New York. So the Atlantic City Conference of 1929 uh, was essentially a gangster conference and the first such of its time. It was in part Rothstein's idea to help reduce costs and conflict among East Coast gangs, to have them sort of work things out. But it was also as much Johnny Torrio's idea, too. Um, of course, the founder of the Southside Gang and Capone's mentor. We do know that it absolutely happened in Atlantic City in 1929, and you have major bosses and future bosses like Capone, Lansky, they're all involved there. The idea of the conference was to get violence off the streets and run the mob as a professional business. The meeting had been a long time coming. Originally thought of by both Luciano's mentor, Arnold Rothstein, and Capone's mentor, Johnny Torrio. But the two protégés were not on the same page. Capone had already set himself apart from the other gangsters and was known to be hot-headed. Nonetheless, Luciano invited him to the conference to hash it out. Nate Henley is the author of the book Al Capone. Other gangsters, either in Chicago or in New York City, were kind of envious of Capone because he was a very powerful man in his, early, you know, in his mid-twenties. At the same time, they were a little wary of him because they did regard him as a bit of a loose cannon and they really didn't like his publicity-seeking uh, personality. That their idea was, you know, you stay out of the papers, you certainly don't hold press conferences in your house, you don't show off for the press, uh, Al Capone enjoyed going down to City Hall in Chicago and just walking around and having people admire him and, you know, and supplicants coming up to him, sort of sucking up to try to get a job or something. And there's no way that Lucky Luciano would do that in New York City, that Luciano was content to sort of stay behind and stay out of the limelight. The other mob bosses were concerned that Capone's courting of the press would have severe consequences. They knew the St. Valentine's Day Massacre would not be ignored, even with the local police in Capone's pocket. Eric Desenhall is the author of The Devil Himself. You know, the, it was very rational for racketeers, as much as people think that they're these big tough guys who are afraid of nothing, they're very afraid of the government. And the last thing they want is to bring down the full force of the New York and the United States government on them. At first, Capone was thrilled to be included with the likes of gangsters like Nucky Johnson and Meyer Lansky. But soon Capone took issue with his competitors telling him how to run his business. And he stormed out. Lawrence Burgreen is the author of Capone, The Man and Era. After the 
Atlantic City Conference uh, when he was part of a national commission. Uh, this seemed to elevate Capone, but actually had the opposite effect. He realized that he had to carve up the pie with some other very important gangsters who would just as soon shoot him as have him as a business partner. I spend all day talking about and researching the Mafia, family life, racketeering, and, of course, the hit jobs. So sometimes I need a break from all of that. My go-to mental palate cleanser is Best Fiends. It's a casual game you can play on your phone, which means anyone can play. But the puzzles are challenging, even for adults. And I can spend as much or as little time as I have playing the game between researching capos. It's a nice break from the dark mafia underworld. The overworld is really beautiful, and everything is nice, bright colors. I love the style of the puzzles. It's a new take on this kind of game. There are a ton of characters, and they're all bugs. Because you have to pick your characters to match the goals in each level, there's a lot of strategy involved. It's like picking the best-suited characters for your own little gang. But for me... It's all about the side quests. You can get secret level-ups and special powers and try to get ahead of your friends. Best Fiends is really different from other puzzle games. There are so many characters it doesn't get old, and there are monthly updates with new levels and events. It's free to download, and you don't need cell service, so I can play it on the subway or while laying low. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cool characters, too, with this five-star rated mobile puzzle game on the Apple App Store and Google Play. You can download Best Fiends for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Just as Luciano warned, Capone's wild killings soon came to the attention of one of the most important people in America. Selwyn Rabb is the author of Five Families. Capone's first big mistake, blunder, was his rivalry with Bugs Moran. He thought he had to eliminate the Bugs Moran gang so he could be, if you want to call it, the boss of bosses, no competition in Chicago. And he engineered. He most probably engineered. He's given credit. I don't think he ever denied it. He's given credit for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, in which uh, it was so outrageous, the idea that uh, a police car could pull up in front of this warehouse, which Bugs Moran was using as his headquarters. And the idea was to get Bugs Moran. And these police officers came in, in uniform, fake police officers, lined up these six victims, and uh, then signaled for the real gunmen with Tommy guns to come in and mow down these poor victims. Now that was too outrageous. That was his first big blunder. He didn't understand the Roaring Twenties was ending. And moreover, there was a new president, Herbert Hoover. And his first thing was he was confronted by headlines from coast to coast about this massacre and about these outrageous activities in Chicago. The local Chicago and Cicero police force had been bribed into compliance with Capone, even into tentative allyship. But this was not on a national scale. And the massacre had garnered Capone national attention. So, yeah, yes, Capone controlled the, new, controlled the Chicago police department and a lot of the politicians. But he didn't control Washington or the federal agencies. And Hoover simply unleashed everything that he could, including the IRS auditors and the Treasury Department investigators, to go out and get Capone. And they did. The newly elected Herbert Hoover couldn't let one of the United States' largest cities be run by gangsters. He launched a special task force with one key mission. Get Capone. Well, the president is outraged and decides that something has to be done now uh, to make Chicago safe again. 
and uh, this leads to uh, the uh, strengthening of the FBI. And uh, the FBI was a different breed of animal because they weren't corruptible. The FBI agents um, who were sent to Chicago to get Capone weren't bribable. They were paid by the federal government, and they had a different allegiance, a different loyalty. Uh, They weren't locals, Um, and this made a big difference. Some of the gangsters tried to get the heat off, They told the press Capone's outfit was disbanding. In the meantime, it was decided Capone would have to lay low. Thomas Repetto is the author of American Mafia. And they decide Al has to disappear. Now, there are a couple of ways to disappear. Torrio was there. That Torrio by then was working in the East. He said, Al, you've got to disappear. Now, there's one way, and you know what that is. And that'll be the way. Or... Find a way to get get yourself arrested. There was safety in the one place no one would expect a notorious gangster to want to go. After the massacre, he had to flee the city. And the mob said, you've got to get out of public sight. So he went to Philadelphia and got himself arrested for carrying a gun. So he went down to Philadelphia. A detective was happened to be just strolling past when Al arrived. The detective had been a guest at Capone's home in Florida a few weeks earlier. But he just happened to be strolling by. He arrests Al carrying a gun. The boss never carries a gun. They were waiting at the station to get him. He he, he pleaded guilty immediately. You know, no Bob boss would do that. He'd have a lawyer. They never convict the guy. Prison was the one place Capone thought his rivals and the feds wouldn't touch him. And far from the usual dank jail cell, Capone's position and money meant he was still living his comfortable high life. His stay in the Philadelphia penitentiary was more like a stay in a hotel or a rest cure. Um, People waited on him hand and foot there. Everybody was corrupted, and he had a very easy time there. It was relaxing. Well, he pleaded guilty, got a year in jail in Philadelphia, thought that would get the heat off in Chicago, but it did not. And the federal government came after him. Back in Chicago, the FBI created a task force of special agents, hand-picked for being incorruptible and fearless. They were so clean-cut and effective, they were quickly dubbed the Untouchables. The group was led by 33-year-old Elliot Ness, and it's soon clear that Capone couldn't buy them off. Uh, Ness said that he put together a team of law enforcement agents whom they called the Untouchables, and they were out to get Capone, but they weren't going to get him with violence. Back in his Philadelphia cell, it had been 10 months since Capone put himself in prison. But now, Big Al was ready to head back to Chicago. But when he returned, he found the government had dragged his reputation through the mud. Al Capone was now public enemy number one. Uh, When he went back to Chicago, things weren't the same anymore. He had to fight for his uh, place in the sun, and uh, he was beginning to lose control of the phenomenon that he had started. Other gangs were moving in very quickly, and so was the federal government. And there was a sense that the lawlessness, the unchecked lawlessness of the Prohibition era was beginning to wind down. The obvious move for Capone would have been to lie low once again. But he couldn't resist the publicity. So Capone decided to organize his own charm offensive. Lawrence Burgreen again. Capone decided to improve his public image by opening a soup kitchen. This was a symptom of the failing economy. And, uh, you know, the, the boom 1920s were ending. The Depression was starting. Many of the working men who were his uh, people were, were out of work. So he wanted to play, again, the Robin Hood figure. And so he wanted to feed them. And not only that, he wanted newsreel cameras to come and see him feeding the working people, taking care of them, doing for them what the government wouldn't do. So, again, he was placing himself above the government as a kind of unofficial protector of the ordinary working man of Chicago. 
um, it, to many of whom he gave employment to. Uh, Capone was an important employer of people, not just as uh, gangsters, but uh, people who were involved in some aspect of bootlegging. Maybe they stored the cars that they used for bootlegging. Maybe they were involved in the production of it. Um, they, they had some something to do with it. And uh, if Capone couldn't employ them, they were often out of work. Capone liked to say that the real crooks weren't hustlers like him, but stock market speculators. But of course, his intentions were always just to make himself look good. Uh, Capone was a narcissist to the extent that he had a distorted impression of reality. So he saw himself as the center of almost anything that was going on, and uh, he felt that he was a force for good in the world, or at least not harm. And so he excused himself all, all his crimes. Capone never really felt a sense of remorse for any of the criminal behavior associated with him. He just felt he was doing what people wanted and becoming popular as a result. Capone said he was the good guy. But the U.S. government could beg to differ. And during the heyday of the Roaring Twenties, Capone was a character, a rogue but a character. Suddenly, uh, instead of money flowing around, everybody being wealthy, uh, there seemed to be no end to America's good fortunes. The 30s, the Dirty 30s started. Now, the Dirty 30s was a depression. A lot of people were out of work. There were bread lines, soup kitchens. And Capone didn't look so interesting anymore. Who cared about his $100 pair of monogram socks or the way he dressed or that he came out? So he started trying to do get his own public relations by opening a soup kitchen, giving out turkeys at Christmas, but it wouldn't play anymore. And now he was going to be a victim because for the first time, instead of trying to pin a murder on him, he made that fatal mistake of his lavish living Working diligently behind the scenes, federal agents had been building a strong case for tax evasion. They were going to show that he didn't pay his taxes. Uh, now, that was tough to do because Capone didn't file tax returns, and they didn't know how much money he earned. Obviously, he earned a fantastic amount, uh, but there were no records. So how did they prove how much he earned, and therefore how much in the way of taxes he should have paid? How did he afford this? Where was his income? Now, the income tax law was relatively due in the U.S. at that time. And a lot of people didn't pay taxes, neither did Al Capone. And he started blundering, and he got bad legal advice. The United States had recently made a ruling stating that illegally earned income was still subject to federal income tax. And amazingly, Capone's lawyers agreed, stating the amount he was willing to pay back taxes on. The admittance was enough for the FBI to bring it to court. They really had him. They found one of his, one of his accountants who, who became a cooperative witness and some very smart auditor found one of his books. That was another thing, one of his other mistakes. He liked to keep records of what, what was coming to him to make sure he wasn't being cheated. So finally they had the goods on him. They didn't get him for any of his gunplay, for any of his murders, for any of his racketeering. They got him on income tax evasion, something he had never anticipated. Audible has the world's largest selection of audiobooks and audio entertainment, including Audible Originals. Audible Originals are stories created exclusively for audio, including documentaries, exclusive audiobooks, and scripted shows that you can't hear anywhere else. Audible keeps you informed, inspired, and entertained. You'll finish more stories when you listen with Audible and always be part of the conversation. With the convenient Audible app, you can listen anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Mobile. Alexa enabled, Bluetooth, and more. Listen at the gym, while shopping, in the car, while traveling, any time you can't read, you can listen with Audible. Audible members get more than ever before. Every month, you can choose one audiobook regardless of price, as well as two Audible originals from a fresh selection. Members stay motivated and inspired with unlimited access to exclusive guided fitness and meditation programs. 
Sign up for free updates from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post, delivered daily to the app. Audible members can easily exchange any title they don't love at any time. Members keep their library of listens forever, even if they cancel. Start a 30-day trial and choose one audiobook plus two Audible originals absolutely free. If you can't get enough gangster history, why not check out some of the books from our contributors? Like Al Capone, Chicago's Crime King by Nate Hindley, or Five Families by Selwyn Rabb. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial. Choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com forward slash mafia or text mafia to 500-500. Capone's indictment hit the headlines, but he wasn't bothered by the charges. He would be able to buy his way into a plea bargain. When he found out he was under investigation by uh, federal auditors, uh, he almost want, he wanted a copper plea, make a plea bargain, admit that he had not paid taxes for several years. In the courtroom, Capone stood strong, confident he would be fine. He pled guilty. Well, Capone's tax trial was in some ways a farce because nobody took it very seriously. There wasn't a sense that this was going to be the end of Capone. It seemed like he was going to have another brush with the law, uh, that he didn't pay his taxes. Ha ha, who would have expected that he would? And then he would eventually get off scot-free and uh, bribe the jurors um, uh, if, if necessary, which is what he did. This wasn't Capone's first rodeo, but it wasn't the government's either. The presiding judge did not accept Capone's plea bargain. Capone quickly changed his plea. Uh, The authorities realized that he probably would try to bribe the jurors or threaten them in some way so they wouldn't convict him. So they brought in, to everybody's surprise at the last minute, another jury who couldn't have been tampered with, or at least not as easily. The new jury found Capone guilty. Deirdre Capone. But it was in the late 20s that the United States decided to add to their income tax law that all money needed to be declared. So when Al Capone discovered that, he offered the United States government a million dollars to take care of his back back taxes, but they wouldn't take that. Now, it was Al Capone, it was also my grandfather, who got arrested for income tax evasion for the same amount of money for the same years. My grandfather got sentenced to three years in a federal penitentiary. Al Capone got sentenced to 11 years. The boss was insulated by 10 levels from the kind of stuff going on in the streets. But income tax was a different story. They brought an income tax case against Capone, convicted him, and he got 11 years for income. Nobody got 11 years for income tax violation. That that kind of case would have resulted in 18 months or something. When Capone was given the maximum sentence for income tax evasion, which was 11 years, um, he was stunned. His lawyers were stunned. Uh, Everybody was stunned. It didn't seem possible that one could be jailed for uh, such a, quote, minor offense. Of course, the government wanted to make an example of Capone. And so they used this as an occasion to give him the maximum. At least they thought they would keep him off the streets and out of harm's way uh, for several years. Capone's downfall made headlines across the world. Meanwhile, in the underworld, the other mobsters were not sure whether to be happy or afraid. I think uh, other gangsters rejoiced that Capone was now no longer at large. On the other hand, they were afraid that the same thing could happen to them. The other bosses were afraid that Capone's fate might become theirs, that they would also be jailed for income tax evasion. And that gave them even more impetus to remain secretive, to stay out of the limelight, to leave the country if they could, Uh, but in any way to avoid the kind of uh, attention that Al Capone got. Well, part of that was simple. All they had to do was stop having press conferences or, you know, they remained in the shadows.
Behind bars, his empire gone, Capone's reputation was in tatters. Now he was just like any other criminal. First of all, when he was first incarcerated, he was sent to Atlanta. And he was in Atlanta federal prison. And he had a very cush life. Um, his family could come and visit him on a regular basis. And he was still running his business. He was still running Chicago from his cell in Atlanta. And President Hoover called the very first um, warden of Alcatraz. And he said to the warden, if you want the world to know what a horrible place Alcatraz is, transfer Al Capone out there. And that is exactly what they did. Now when you go and visit Alcatraz, what you do is you get on a ferry and then you take the ferry out to the island. The very last sign that you see before you get on the ferry is a quote by the first warden of Alcatraz. And he is quoted as saying, Alcatraz was opened to incarcerate irredeemable men, men who could never return back to society. Capone was soon moved to the island fortress of Alcatraz off the San Francisco Bay. The move was done mostly for the government to show off to the press. America's most notorious criminal was now in its most notorious prison. Alcatraz was designed as a jail for super criminals. It was offshore. It was considered impossible to escape. Uh, prisoners spent most of their time in isolation. Uh, and uh, it was considered the ultimate weapon against uh, criminals um, and, and the most modern. Um, it, uh, it's today, it's a, you can visit it. It's a, it's a national park. <laughs> so you can go visit Al Capone's cell. He was in a six foot by 10 foot cell and they put him on the outside where he could look across the bay at San Francisco. By the time he was there, Prohibition had ended. Prohibition ended in 1933. He was sent out to Alcatraz in 1935. Hiring can be a slow process. Cafe Altura's COO Dylan Miskowitz needed to hire a director of coffee for his organic coffee company. But he was having trouble finding qualified applicants. So he switched to ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. Its technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. So you get qualified candidates fast. Dylan posted his job on ZipRecruiter and said he was impressed by how quickly he had great candidates apply. He also used ZipRecruiter's candidate rating feature to filter his applicants so he could focus on the most relevant ones. And that's how Dylan found his new director of coffee in just a few days. With results like that, it's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try ZipRecruiter for free at our web address, ZipRecruiter.com forward slash mafia. That's ZipRecruiter.com forward slash M-A-F-I-A. ZipRecruiter.com forward slash mafia. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Capone began to recede from the man he once was. Inside prison, his health deteriorated rapidly from both drug addiction withdrawal and more chronically from neurosyphilis. Al Capone suffered from syphilis. He acquired it from prostitutes as a young man in Brooklyn, didn't realize that he had it, and it explains a lot about his behavior and his temperamental outbursts throughout his life. It contributed to the legend of Al Capone because it made him seem even more violent or unstable than he was. Um, as he got older, it also shattered his health because there was no cure for it at the time. His health in decline 
Capone's reputation made him a target for others inside the prison to make names for themselves. Uh, when Al Capone uh, was in Alcatraz, uh, it was not a, it was humiliating. Uh, in part because other prisoners were not afraid of him. Um, he was given a very derogatory term. Um, there was a very minor criminal there named Jimmy Lucas from Texas who attacked Al Capone and stabbed him. Uh, that would have been unthinkable a few years earlier when Capone seemed invulnerable and omnipotent. No longer, now he was just another prisoner in very poor health, failing quickly and being preyed on by other prisoners um, in this very sordid environment of Alcatraz, which was a place that really struck terror in most Americans. There was only two people that were ever served time out on Alcatraz that were arrested for income tax evasion. One was my uncle, Al Capone. The second was my uncle's bodyguard and friend who insisted that he get transferred from Atlanta to Alcatraz so he could take care of Al Capone. Soon, Capone was moved to a solitary cell and then to the prison hospital. When Al Capone was in Alcatraz, um, he, he deteriorated rapidly. He often spent his time in a fog of dementia. Um, he was bloated. He was out of shape. Uh, other prisoners attacked him. Um, he did not seem anything like a dangerous person. He seemed like a helpless uh, patient, which is really what he was. Uh, there was no cure for it, and he was slipping fast. Um, he uh, spent his time uh, in irrational kind of behavior um, and was unable to conduct any sort of business with his former rackets. Um, he was a lost soul. In 1939, Capone was released from prison due to his medical condition. The neurosyphilis wreaked havoc on his brain function, and he needed to be cared for. He went to his home in Miami, where his brother and family conducted business in his stead. But it was such a different era. You know, Prohibition was long gone, and uh, even the Depression was over. The war was coming. Uh, Capone was a holdover from another era, uh, almost a joke and a kind of a tourist attraction. Al Capone's career was a short, fast ride. Uh, by the time he was 27, he was the most powerful and best-known figure in Chicago. Um, he was a national figure. He was immensely wealthy. In today's dollars, he would have been a billionaire, um, and he, he didn't pay taxes. Um, and he was very influential. Um, he wanted to go into politics. He fancied himself a good Samaritan, oddly enough. Um, but once the syphilis set in and began to deteriorate, his personality deteriorated and his judgment went. And once the federal government went after him for taxes, his fall from grace was, came very quickly. From the time he was 32 or so on, um, he was no longer the Al Capone of legend. And by then, pr the Prohibition era was over. Um, his uh, basic income had been uh, evaporated. It was here that Deidre remembers meeting Capone for the first time. My mother was pregnant with me at the time that Al Capone got released from Alcatraz. And she told me the story that um, the family had a big party for him in Chicago when he got released. And my mother said that Al was there, but he would come up to her and say, who are you? And then he would go over to his own sister and say, who are you? The very last days of Al Capone's life were first he came to Chicago and he was spending Christmas at the Chicago home. I remember going into the Chicago house and my grandmother decorated the Christmas tree and it was covered with real candles burning on that tree. It was an awesome sight for me. I was seven years old. And of course, Al Capone was there and he loved to dress up as Santa Claus. And I have a picture of me on his lap when he was dressed up as Santa Claus. So this would be 1947. Well, he came down with pneumonia. Capone's last days were spent with his family. He died of a stroke that brought on a coma. Without him, in Havana, Cuba, some of the biggest mob bosses met to plan the mob of the future. The leadership role would be taken up by Lucky Luciano. 
Luciano was the uh, new generation of bosses. There were new crimes, prohibition, labor racketeering. Uh, he wanted the American mafia to be a mirror of American capitalism, to cash in on anything that worked with capitalism. And he wasn't going to be restricted just to prohibition or just to gambling or to what they, uh, the old bosses did about shaking down extortion of their own people in their own neighborhoods. This was a new era and he was going to modernize the mob. And that is exactly what he did. But Capone's contribution would be noted. His gang warfare and love of attention was taken as ways the mob should not behave. Instead, they would work together to create an entire underground society, one that would dominate the United States' largest cities for generations. They called it Our Thing, La Cosa Nostra. All he wanted was everyone should share the wealth, no boss of bosses. So in that effect, in that sense, his legacy was something that led to the golden age of the mafia in America. It lasted for more than 50 years. Capone started out with a bang, a successful bootlegger in the right place at the right time, and taking full advantage of that. But perhaps he went out at the right time as well. Maybe Al Capone wouldn't have succeeded in the new era of the Mafia. The economic and social landscape of the United States shifted drastically with the advent of the Depression. The stock market crashed in 1929. Uh, the Depression began. It seemed endless. It dragged on for more than a decade. Um, it ended only with the beginning of World War II. Um, again, more economic uh, austerity and hardships. So the conditions of the 1920s in which Al Capone had found, you know, so fertile for his flourishing, they, they, they no longer existed uh, for, for many years. In the next episode... A lucky break lands a butcher's apprentice as a forerunner for a career mafia embezzler. Uh, Roy was the, the person who got things done on the street. He was the earner. He was the one that was involved in the business and was the one to see that if there was any risk that business, he could roll his sleeves up and do what was necessary to protect the family. With a knack for crime, Roy DeMeo found himself in the world of money laundering, pornography, and stealing cars. So what had happened is well, Roy moved into it, organized it, but then took it a step further. Said, well, if we're not only going to lend money to legitimate people, I mean, he, he did dentists, doctors, lawyers, firemen. He said, we're going to do bad people. And the bad people are going to pay us because we'll kill them if they don't. But he soon finds that what he really has a knack for is murder. What Henry Ford was to the automobile industry, Roy was to murder. Uh, he streamlined it, he organized it, and he killed with efficiency. This has been an Audio Boom and World Media Rights co-production, hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley, Rachel Jacobs, Casey Georgie, and Karen Bevan, and by Pascal Hughes for World Media Rights. We had additional production help from World Media Rights by Gerald Zabengua and James Tyndale. David McNabb is the series' creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Thanks to Best Fiends, Audible, and Zip Recruiter for sponsoring this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. <laughs>